One of the things that I need more than anything else is to have more courage. I see that within myself, and I think that, that all of us, to an extent, we, we need help with being courageous. That's, that's why we are a group and not individuals, because we help each other embolden ourselves to stand up for what is right. One of the most courageous and daring people that I know who was courageous in calling people to restoration to God, calling people to repentance, was John, John the Immerser, John the Baptist. And of all of the things that he did, one of the things that is the most courageous that he did was the thing that ultimately resulted in his death. In Matthew 14, starting in verse 1, here's what Matthew records. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And this takes a lot of courage. This is not a lesson about marriage or about divorce or remarriage or what Jesus teaches in Matthew 9 or Matthew 5.30 or 1 Corinthians 7. That's, that's not what this, this lesson is about. This lesson is about looking at what it takes to be the type of person who would stand up for the truth when it's terrifying. And here's the thing about courage and fear. Courage is just doing what is right even when it's scary. Because we are emotional, because we are vulnerable, it is nearly impossible for us to totally do away with the fear to do the right thing. Courage is doing it anyway. And what we have here with John is confronting someone, and we don't know the specifics other than we can just extrapolate from this passage that this was not a marriage that God recognized. It was inappropriate. It was, it was simplistically in the category of sexual immorality. He says they don't have any business being together. He confronted them. He was courageous, and they arrested him. If you continue to read, what you see is that there's a little bit of a, a wager, and Herod is... is his hand is forced, so to speak, and he has John killed and his head delivered on a platter. Why? Because this man was courageous enough to stand up to those who needed to repent to God and tell them that. I want to look at one man in particular this evening who shows us a very simple process or formula for having this type of mindset and of courage. Throughout time, the people of God would do good and they would do bad and they would do good and they would do bad and God would bless them and then God would curse them. The northern kingdom, after they divided, the northern kingdom didn't have any good kings. They went into uh, Assyrian captivity and never came back. Some of their descendants came back and intermarried, and that's where we get the Samaritans from. The southern kingdom of Judah went into Babylonian captivity. It was prophesied they would be there for 70 years, and after 70 years, they were released. King Cyrus, the Persian king, releases them. And if you look at the very end of 2 Chronicles, the last few verses of 2 Chronicles, they are identical, if you flip a couple pages over, depending on what kind of Bible you have, to the very first few verses of Ezra, because they go right together. Ezra is an historical account of the return of the people that God foretold would return. And so after 70 years, and the 70 years is not exactly precise in the sense that they began to go back after 70 years, but they went in different waves of groups. What we're going to see is that uh, Ezra is in a group that's a few decades later. But after 70 years in Babylonian captivity, the Israelites were allowed to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, to reestablish the law and the covenant, to rebuild the walls of the city. They were able to be a nation again. The 
people of God, recognizing their covenant with God. Now, Ezra's mission was to help reestablish the law of Moses and to reinstate the observance of the people's covenant with God. It's an interesting thing, the difference between approaching someone who is a Christian and someone who's not a Christian. Paul talks about this clearly in 1 Corinthians 5, that Christians aren't to expect non-Christians to be true to a covenant that they have not made. Someone who isn't a Christian is someone who hasn't made a covenant with God, and there's not a reasonable expectation for them to actually follow what God says. You're going to find that principle within this, though is the difference between those who are of the covenant and those who are not of the covenant. It doesn't make any sense for me to go to someone who is not a Christian or who is not part of the covenant and to say, how dare you break the covenant of God if they haven't made that covenant with God? Now, we can appeal to them to make a covenant with God and to show them how their life is transgressing against God, but that's a different thing than going to someone who, in fact, has entered into the covenant with God, they are a Christian, they are a child of God, and yet, for some reason and in some way, they have fallen away. It takes a lot of courage to go to that person and to say, this needs to be done. My heart is broken over what's going on, and you need to come back. I want you to turn to Ezra chapter 9. I don't have, I'm not going to have this up on the screen. I want you to look in your Bible. Ezra chapter 9. Uh, it's right after, it's at, right after 1 and 2 Chronicles. Uh, right before Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. It's right nestled in there. It's only 11 chapters long. Let's see. Or is that 10 chapters? Excuse me. 10 chapters. It's only 10 chapters long. It's not very big. But it's not that small. I'll give you a second to get there. Ezra 9. Starting in verse 1, I want you to see what, what happens when Ezra shows up on the screen, on the, on, the, on the scene, and he gets the report. He gets the report of what's been going on. In chapter 8, they make uh, some sacrifices, and they go through some ceremonial things. And then at the beginning of chapter 9, they have some news for Ezra. They have something to tell Ezra. Ezra 9, starting in verse 1, <clears throat> after these things had been done, the officials approached me, and this is Ezra speaking in the first person. Ezra wrote this part. He says, after these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites had not separated themselves from the peoples of the land with their abominations, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the land. And in this faithlessness, that's a key word, in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. I'm going to stop right there and just say this. This doesn't have anything to do with racial differences, different uh, biological or genetic differences in people. This has everything to do with the people who are of the covenant of God joining themselves to people who are not of the covenant of God. They were warned not to do that because God knew all along that if they did that, this is the same principle at the end of 1 Corinthians 7, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, uh, about not being unequally yoked. What has darkness and light to do with one another? What does a Christian have to do with a non-Christian together? A union together with someone who is not of the covenant, God says, you don't ever even think about doing that because they're going to take you into their evil and wicked ways. But they hadn't obeyed that. They dove right head first into it. Verse 3, Ezra says, As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled my hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. Then all who trembled at the words of God 
of the God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying, and here he begins to pray to God about this situation. He says, oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are slaves, yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And so he's saying here that throughout time, as I said before, the, the people of God would be evil and they would be good, evil, good, and God would punish them and would bless them. And in God's punishment, notice the pattern, in God's punishment, he would always find someone who was faithful. Elijah said, there's nobody else. Just let me die. And God said, no, 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 no. There are thousands who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. When God looked upon the earth and he saw that every imagination of their thought was only evil continually, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. There was a remnant of the faithful, even amongst the punishment. When you look at the nation of Israel taken out of Egypt, and yet they... They don't trust in God when he wants to take them into the land of the book of Numbers. And so he says, you're going you're gonna to dwell in the, the wilderness for 40 years. And everybody that's over 20 years old is going to die in the wilderness. Those who were younger were those who he allowed to go in after he punished the other. It was the remnant, the remnant of the faithful. And even now... Even now, Ezra recognizes that in the evil that was done, especially by the northern kingdom, they never came back, but of the southern kingdom, God said, no, I have a purpose for you, and I know that there are some who are faithful, and it's this, this remnant of all of those who do evil, who are, are of the people of God, we should always be striving to be the remnant and Ezra is brought into a situation where he sees that even the remnant, they need, to borrow from his words, they need reviving. You know, where do we get the term revival from? We don't use that term a lot, to have a revival or to have a gospel meeting or something like that. It is to come in and to say with courage, this is the way of God and this is the way you need to live. And Ezra finds himself in that situation. Verse 10, and now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servant, the prophet, saying, the land that you are entering to, to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the land, with their abominations that have filled up from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons. Neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land, and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. Verse 13, And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less 
than our iniquities deserved. He recognized that we, our sin is, we are, we are not neck deep in it. It is, it is over our heads. He says, you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant as this. Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us? So that there should be no remnant nor any to escape. O Lord, the God of Israel, you are just. For we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt for none can stand before you because of this. So he recognizes this is a problem. He's praying to God that we need to take care of this problem. All of chapter 10 is about rectifying this problem and about national repentance. Chapter 10 and verse 1. We'll only go through the first five verses. While Ezra prayed and made confessions, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men and women and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, of the sons of Elam, addressed Ezra. And this is what he said. We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope. For Israel, in spite of this, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task. He's telling Ezra, it's your task and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Then Ezra rose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they would do as had been said, so they took the oath. They send a message out to all the people, and they say, if you find yourself in this situation, in this marriage, you have three, three days to come here and, and to report, so to speak, or all of your inheritance and all of your property will be confiscated. He says, you got to show up. And believe it or not, everybody showed up. They all got there. And if you continue to look through to the end of this chapter, you see down through verse 16, they did it. They gathered everybody together and they said, well, there's so many that this is going to take a little while. This is going to take several days. And he said, well, it's going to take several days. That's okay. Let's do it. And what's interesting is, is that the book of Ezra closes with a gigantic couple of paragraphs here. That's just a list of names, name after name, after name, after name, after name. You know what those names are? Those names are people, including priests, who were married to foreign wives. It ends with that. It ends with, this is the list of names of the people who had these foreign wives. But they all repented. They all severed these ties. And it said some of them even had children with these women. And they severed these ties. We don't know the specifics of all of this. But what we do know is this, is that it was the only way for them to be right with God. Repentance called for them to sever all of these marriages, likely hundreds, maybe thousands. We don't know exactly. It's, it took them several days to sort it all out. But they did. And it started with Ezra. And when I read something like that, it blows my mind. When I read something about what John did, it blows my mind because I see someone who comes into a situation, and imagine yourself just finding yourself in a situation where you walk in and it's made privy to you, someone tells you, or you find out in some way, this sin is going on all around among the people who are of the covenant of God. If you found yourself in that situation, what would you do? It's, it's terrifying. It's a terrifying thing for me to think about. Because especially in our culture today, unless you're from a particular slant, it's frowned upon to uh, chastise or indict or reprimand or challenge people's lifestyles. It's terrifying, in fact. And it takes courage 
if you're going to do it. And so when I think about Ezra and I think about what he fearlessly, not that he didn't have fear, but he pushed aside and he says, something has to be done. I, I sit back in marvel of this. Seeing, seeing uh, what is lacking in myself and desiring to want to be like this. To want to be someone who has the courage to bring restoration to the people of God. We should all want that. He was one man. He said, look, this is what needs to happen. And immediately everybody said, you know what? You're right. We're behind you. Let's do it. Whatever it takes. And so when we think of Ezra, we think of or I think of this, that he has and had the courage to bring restoration, to bring revival. Another way to think of this is he had the courage to bring people to repentance. He was brave enough to do what needed to be done. Which begs the question, how can I be like that? What was his recipe? What kind of man was he? Why was he the type of man that would do that? Why was he, of all of the people who were of the covenant of God, was he the one that stood apart as the one to lead them into repentance to God? You find that in chapter 7. At least in my humble opinion, this is the simple recipe. And I hope that you already know which passage I'm going to look at. I'm not going to take long looking at it. Ezra doesn't even show up in the book of Ezra until chapter 7. Verse 1, during the reign of Artaxerxes. In chapter 1, it was King Cyrus was the one who first let them go back. But now it's Artaxerxes. Let's just start in verse 9 here. In verse 9. On the first day of the first month, he, it's Ezra, began to go up from Babylonia, and on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. You may have a different translation, and that's fine. We're going to kind of go with this one. I'm going to quickly, I'm going to quickly go through what are really these four things, which I think these are the keys or building blocks to this man doing what needed to be done. If we want to know how to have this kind of courage, then we need to be willing to be the kind of person or commit to being the kind of person that he was committed to being. First, Ezra He set his heart or he prepared his heart. Just for lack of time and because it's 3,000 degrees in here, we're not going to go into any of these passages, but if you'd like them, I'll give them to you. When you think of the idea of setting your heart, some of us, you know, we think the whole statement, he set his heart to study the law of God. Uh, We think, you know, I really need to study more and I need to but we don't really have a plan or we don't have a system or we're not in the routine. We're not in that good habit or we don't not surrounded ourselves with those friends who will do that with us. And so the study's not going to happen until we, until we set our mind to the task, until we actually make that mental decision. As I've said in some, in some other lessons uh, previously, that our actions follow our minds. And so we have to take control of our minds the good and evil actions that we would do, they begin in our heart, number one. And next, thinking about him setting his heart. Faithfulness is determined by the condition of our heart, not by a checklist of things that we do. Now, is it, is it important for us to do what is right? Yes. But if we're doing the right thing, but our heart is not right to begin with, we're just punching a checklist. Someone was asking me this morning about baptism. And 
you know, my lesson was about, was about having heard the gospel in vain. And someone was asking me this morning, can someone be baptized in vain? And I said, well, absolutely. Uh, I, I said, every, every child that has been baptized was baptized in vain for the simple purpose that there wasn't in, any cognitive agreement with or understanding of what, in fact, they were doing. They didn't care why they were doing what they were doing or didn't understand why they were doing what they were doing and didn't choose to do why they, to do, why they uh, do what they were doing. And an adult who does not understand what it is for and does not choose to do it as a turning to God, turning their mind to God, the answer of a good conscience towards God, then absolutely baptism can just be taking a bath, getting wet. Now, that's why 1 Peter 3.21 says that, that our baptism is not the removal of filth of the flesh. It's the answer of a good conscience towards God. Because if all that mattered was, you know, we just got to dunk them in the water. No, what we've got to do is change their heart. Because if we don't change their heart, it doesn't matter what actions follow. Because it'll all be in vain. This is repentance. Repentance happens in the heart. This is the part of the person that turns to God before anything else. Essentially what this means to set your heart or prepare your heart to really understand what God has said, what he's revealed to us. This is a reassessment of self, of who you are, of your motives. It takes honesty. It takes honesty about your motives. It takes honesty about your weaknesses. Uh, it, takes, it takes honesty about the lies that you've been telling yourself. Uh, it takes a, an honesty of self, a self-inventory, to be able to have your heart right before you even begin to approach what God wants you to do. Which brings us to the next part. Ezra had set his heart or prepared his heart to study the law of the Lord. Now, why would anyone do that? Why is that so important? When you, when you approach the law of the Lord, what happens is, is that it requires us to deny our own wisdom. Uh, it, it causes us to make the decision. Am, am I going to try to outsmart God or try to figure out something better than God? Or am I just going to submit totally, totally to him? We have to deny our wisdom. Uh, next, we, we must see Scripture as the window into the heart of God. We're not going to study the law. I made, this, made mention of this uh, maybe a week or so ago, of how uh, another mind-boggling thing of, for, uh, of mine is to, is to just think that God has actually revealed his heart to us in this. When we actually understand that it is, that's when we'll actually dive in. That's when we'll actually care to see what it says. When we study the law of the Lord, we've got to seek within it to learn what God wants our lives to look like. What does it really mean to be faithful to him and pleasing to him? That, that has to be our new motive. That, that won't happen unless we've prepared our heart to do so, but we're studying the law because we want to know that. We must realize that there's no hope anywhere else. That our spiritual well-being, eternal life, salvation can only be found in what God has revealed to us. Which brings us to the next one. Ezra prepared his heart to study the law of the Lord and to, and to do it. And to do it. When you think of someone who has decided that they are going to do it, they've decided that they're going to be in covenant relationship with God. And when you've decided to be in covenant relationship with God, then you've made a decision to be faithful, which puts you on the hook. Anyone who is a Christian, they're on the hook. And what I mean is this, is they are fair game, and maybe that's not a good word. It is our responsibility to confront them in love with the truth of their spiritual status. And so now that we're in covenant relationship with God, We've got to stay faithful and help others stay faithful. Now that we have been elevated by Jesus, then we have to do our duty. Um, we, we have to be 
as Luke 17, 10 calls it, the unprofitable servant, doing what is my duty to do. We have to have that disposition that I don't really have any say in my life. My life doesn't belong to me anymore. Now that we've given our lives to God, we have to recognize that we, we don't belong to ourselves, that we belong to a God who wants to transform us. And that really is key. Ezra understood that belonging to God meant that whatever was going on to the nation of Israel, God had plans for it to be transformed. And it's only transformed when God has his hand in the mix, when his will is inserted and people are submissive to his will. And, that's, and only then is when restoration happens. And so the ultimate goal of obedient faith is a daily transformation to align ourselves with really the greatest example of Jesus, but to align ourselves with all, all Scripture, to have a godly attitude, to have a godly lifestyle. And the fourth thing, the fourth part of this, he prepared his heart to study the law and to do the law and to teach it, to teach these commandments, these ordinances, to teach them in Israel, to propagate the covenant, the parameters, the standard of God. This is what you've agreed to be. This is who you've, you have agreed to be. Then, then I'm going to tell you to be true to it. And throughout time, there have been many people who have done this sort of thing, and the people said, we don't think so. We don't want to. And that's one of the reasons why it's so terrifying to do. One of the greatest joys in the world, and I, we don't have a whole lot more said about Ezra, but what was going on with Ezra when he learned about this? He said he was appalled. He, he ripped his clothes and he pulled out his hair. He was mourning. He was upset. He couldn't believe what was going on. And he challenges them. And what did they do? Did they say, no, we don't want to. We don't care about you. We don't care about God. or his... No, they said, we will do it. You lead the way. We're behind you. Let's do this. We want to be right with God. And there's no greater joy, really, than someone when challenged to turn back to the covenant, says, yes, you're right. I need to. I need to be right with God. But that's so rare, and we're so fearful that they're going to reject us as if they're rejecting us and not rejecting God, that usually we give in to the fear. And so in teaching the law of the Lord, we have to understand that this is one of the most, if not the most, important duty or purposes of the people of God, of each individual, to propagate the truth, to challenge those who are covenant people, to return in faithfulness to the covenant, and to introduce those who are not of the covenant to the covenant. The rules don't apply the same as far as those who are outside the covenant and those who are not in the covenant in the old law. The new covenant is for all, and we are to show it to them in a way that that appropriately communicates it so that they see, number one, that it is worthy to follow, but number two, they don't have any delusions about it being easy rather than difficult. But that is one of the, if not the greatest purpose of the church, is to uphold and to propagate truth. And so when we think about this teaching of the law of the Lord, and these are all things that were part of that formula for why when push came to shove, when sin was presented to him, he said, this has to change. He had prepared his heart to study and to do it himself and to teach it. And what did he teach? And what did he really internalize? You know, when you think of someone who is presented with sin and they hear about something you know, I, I, one of the reasons that I really, really hate gossip is because I don't want to hear that people are sinning. I, number one, I don't want to know about it because it breaks my heart. And you can see that, that he wanted to live a holy life and he knew that these people were supposed to be holy and he found, about, found out about unholiness. And when we're teaching people, we have to teach people that, that first part there. We have to show people that God 
is holy. And we have to show them that sin condemns them. And we have to show them that there's a need for reconciliation. Now we today, apart from Ezra, we understand that there's reconciliation in the sacrifice of Christ. It continues. When we're teaching the law of the Lord, we have to show that salvation is found in Christ. And in particular, what we talked about this morning, his death, burial, and his resurrection. We have to show them, and this goes hand in hand with it as well. We have to show them that maintaining the covenant or the relationship with God happens through faithfulness, through a faithful life, through submission, through a godly lifestyle, and that only those are found within Scripture. And of course, if we don't do this, then we aren't being faithful. And so you found this man who approached this people with the mindset that God's law and God's way and God's holiness are paramount. They are the most important thing in this nation. And when sin is brought to him, he is sick over it. He hates it. And when we have such a relationship with God's holiness and a holy life, then what happens when we are, when we are made privy to sin in someone's life, it should make us sick. It should, it should make us have, have an emotional reaction to that. Because we understand how serious and severe it is to sin against God, especially someone who's made a covenant with God. Now, I encourage you to go into this study more and to look deeper into the ins and outs of the type of mindset that was able to embolden and fill this man with the courage to bring the restoration of these people. These people who had been given this this new chance as the remnant to come in and be the people of God. And just just to recap, If we're going to be able to have this courage, the courage to bring people to restoration, to bring revival in people's souls, to be able to bring repentance in people's lives, then just as Ezra did, we have to be willing to prepare our hearts to study what God has said, to do it ourselves, and to teach it to others. We find that that's the type of heart that when when we've done that, when we find ourselves in that situation that we really don't want to find ourselves in, we will have the courage to say what needs to be said and do what needs to be, do, needs to be done. And this will be a personal growth journey that I will never finish. I hope you've been challenged in some way by Ezra, for the most part, and John in, in a small part. These great examples of people who loved God, they loved godliness, they understood the necessity of being true to their covenant. And so I encourage you to be true to your covenant. You know, if someone is not in covenant with God, they can do that by coming to him through Christ, the perfect sacrifice. They can be washed by the blood of Christ. If they're united with him in baptism, they can be united with his death and his burial and his resurrection. And God can add them to the body of Christ and they can be raised to walk a new life, a life of holiness. And with the expectation that they are a covenant person, they made a covenant with God and they are an unprofitable servant doing what is their duty to do and that it is the best life to live. Perhaps you found yourself struggling with this courage. Here's what I would tell you to do. I would tell you to do everything you can to attach yourselves to people, to surround yourselves by people who you have seen be courageous, who have had compassionate hearts and who have been loving. And you will grow in that way and you will be emboldened in that way. You'll be challenged in that way. And just like the people, just like the people who had intermarried with those who were not of the covenant, the more time we spend with those who are not of the covenant, 
the more that we fill ourselves up with those types of relationships, then the less courage that we're going to have, the less likely we're going to be to rock the boat, and the less likely we are that we're going to bring those people into covenant relationship with God, and less likely to bring those who are covenant people back into restoration, into faithfulness. Randy is going to have a song for us. I encourage you, don't brush aside these times as the tradition. If you need something, if you need some help, we want to pray for you. We want to know about it. That's the whole point of this lesson, really, is being surrounded by people so that we can be emboldened in our faith and secure and on the right path together. So if there's any need that you have, come as we stand and sing this song.